Welcome to the Tea Grannies. I'm Elise. And I'm Maria. Today we're here to chat about world building. So pour yourself a glass of wine and let's get started. Why did we call this episode Wine and World Building, you ask? Uh, Because it sounded good. And we wanted to drink wine on a Monday afternoon while on a video call, so you all get to join us. Uh, (laughs) But before we jump into our world building chat, we're going to start with our two submissions. Prologue. The council gathered, not for negotiating the city's errands, but for relishing the aura of the coronation day, fragranced with valuable cinnamon incense, music, meat, mead, merriment, and the promise of a new future after a decade of wars with the barbarians. Fancy burgundy and gold textiles outspread under the ceiling, spiraling down columns, besieging the air of the room held by marble dryad gargoyles. A large oak table was set, gazed upon by a massive alabaster statue of Zeus. In the middle, the greedy hands of the council abounded, wrestling over the brandied meat of a lavish bull, laying in a silver platter, as vast as four merged shields, carpeted with sheets of vine leaves studded with vinegar-marinated potatoes. They spilled the arrayed goblets of wine as they bent over the table to snatch slices of the luscious slaughter, but it didn't matter, for the vineyards blossomed richly, promising a good fortune for the land. Amphorae of sweet wine were resupplied by some of the swarming maidservants, whom the sway of their waists and the fluid movements of their bodies excited the men as much as what was contained in the shimmering vessels. They used them for filling their cups and satisfying other needs. Musicians indulged manipulating the attendants' temperaments, soothed or frenzy, by fiddling the strings of their lyres. The men got drunk. Jests were exchanged. Snorts, grumps, and snickers undulated under the ceiling. Falling goblets clanked on the ground. Wine fed throats and cracks of the floor. The pleasurable spree seemed to oversweep the room like an ocean's wave, drowning everyone but one. The new king. At the edge of the table, he sat still on his chair. A golden crown, studded with a magnificent green gemstone, coronated his dark hair. The beardless, shaved skin of his face shone with fragrant youth, despite his late middle age. His honey-amber eyes flared with ambition. He occasionally passed a glance at the feast, wearing a slight grin as his lips stiffly parted, slowly sipping the wine, pleased by the merry spirit. For most of the time, he gazed at the goblet in his palm, indulging his reflection on the gold amid the fluttering firelight. His eyes were more interested in what lay inwards, a dormant desire that was reawakened. So my overall comments are that I love the setting and the details in this piece. Um, I ultimately think the prologue is maybe not necessary or that we're starting the story in the wrong place. We don't get an introduction to the king until the very end. And I'd like to see him introduced somewhere around like the second paragraph. Um, And then we learn all this nice setting in the beginning and the world building through his eyes instead of kind of in an omniscient way, which makes it feel a bit detached. Um, and this is a great a great example of a little too much of the world being shown to us before we get to character and plot. Mm. So as good as the details are, we still need character early on in the page or readers are going to lose interest. Um, world, bid, world building does not drive the story. Characters drive the story. And so you need to make sure that you hit us with that pretty early on. Uh, and I do think that if we get the king earlier and we get a hint of the ambitions and the plans and everything like that and the world building is then built into that scene. It would improve the flow and the readability throughout the whole piece. Um, there's a few things I liked. I left little notes <laughs> going through. Mm-hmm. and um, But my other main comment was that beware of the long sentences, even if you're mm. using commas. So not everybody is going to touch on this, yeah. but it can feel quite heavy uh, to the reader. And I think sometimes when you're using a lot of descriptions, um the the language is it's too much for our brains when we're reading it yeah. it's a lot of intense language a long sentence um I don't know about other readers but maybe this is ADHD or something to start to lose 
focus a bit near the end of the sentence if it's like that. Um, so I would kind of go through um, and have a look and see where things can be simplified. And also we'll make those nice descriptions. Like there's a line here somewhere uh, about the um, vinegar marinated potatoes. It's mm. so like that's something that would really pop in a more simple sentence, whereas it gets lost in the descriptions. Yeah. And um, yeah, it could make it just be a little bit more smooth. And I do think, uh, and I could be wrong, I think this uh, writer's second language is English. And so some things could have been lost uh, in translation. And I think if, if, you're, if it's being written in English, I would suggest that the writer kind of flip through their favorite English books and compare the complexity of the sentences in the language, just make sure that they're getting what they want, getting the point across the way they want it. Um, because you can always add, it's always better to start simple and build on it. That's, that's my opinion anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, right where we meet the king, that's where I found things really interesting. And that's why I wanted to see it earlier on and then cut some, some of the scene settings to make it kind of pop. Uh, and then I think you'll have the reader hooked and then you can continue with the world building and, and show us a bit more of scenery and the characters. But yeah, I mean, overall, I mean, I can, I did already chat with this writer before, so I know a little bit about the background of this story, and I oh, think cool. that it's going to be really interesting. Awesome. Um, yeah, this submission paints a very vivid picture. I'll try to keep my notes a little bit shorter because I riff off of what Maria says quite a bit. <laughs> it makes it sound like I don't have my own opinions. I do. Um, <laughs> Just get to the document first. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was a little late to the party on this one, but um, I enjoyed reading it. Like, it just... I don't know how else to describe it. This this piece just paints a picture for you. Like that's literally what's happening in my mind. Like the the different colors are coming into play. The different aspects of the scene are just kind of filling out this movie playing in my head of this feast, this party. Um, it's magnificent. There's so much color and life and I can hear the noises and I can smell the food. And I think it's overwhelming in exactly the way that the writer maybe intends it to be, which is, which is brilliant. It's great. Um, but like Maria has said, like, we don't really get much character or plot in these pages. Um, we're given kind of an image, we're given a picture of this lavish feast, and we briefly at the end learn about this king presiding over his coronation feast. Um, but that's it. That's all we get. So at this point, for me personally, it wouldn't be enough to keep me interested in the story. I'd I'd get a little lost and kind of be like, okay, what's, what's the point? I like it. I want mm -hmm. things to move forward a little bit. Um, so I, I would really love to see a version of this where we open, like you were saying, from the king's perspective. I would say even from the first line that somehow we fit in who it is, whose eyes we're watching this unfold through um, to get mm -hmm. that character immediately. I feel like that would just add so much more richness to the scene. And then we can get his opinion on everything. So um, we don't really have a sense. He's very mysterious at this point, but we see him watching all this happening and I kind of get the, I get the vibe that he's not as taken with the feasting as all the other people are. Like he's content. I don't think he's yeah. upset, but I was curious, like, is he looking at them? Like, uh, look at these, my, these, my people, they're having a great time and that brings me joy. Or is it kind of like, look at all these fools and he's laughing at them. Like, mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't know enough about him to understand how he's, how he's seeing everything. And that's what I wanted. Um, and I wanted it sooner. So mm -hmm. I would I would cut back on the descriptions a bit. Um, as lavish and beautiful as they are, they're just there's a bit too much going on. And I felt this as I was reading it out loud as well. I highlighted a couple of lines which is like, this is a really long sentence. I got lost while reading it. And it's just hard to follow the flow, the train of thought when things go on for more than a few words. So um, keep an eye out for those. And then I think I'd like to see those edits and learn a bit more of the story before deciding if this prologue is really necessary or not. I think that's mm -hmm. a great point to make because a lot of times in my experience, prologues are kind of just an excuse for the writer to include information that doesn't actually fit. I'm guilty of this. I've tried to do it and then realized, oh, cutscene. Um, so yeah, I understand yeah. that, but I don't know enough about this story to say whether that's what's happening here. So I'm very curious. Um, but yeah, I'd like to see some of those things reworked before I would really be intrigued enough to find out more. But mm -hmm. beautiful descriptions. Like I can't, I can't emphasize that enough. The picture I had in my head was yeah. like, it's like I was watching a movie. It was amazing. 
Yeah, that's how I felt too. That's yeah. exactly how I felt too. It kind of gave me the vibe of like that Troy movie. Mm, mm-hmm. You know, that's kind of the the feeling I got from it. Mm, and that was, I nice. think, the point as well, which is awesome. There you go. <laughs> but that is the feeling I got when I was reading it. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely like a movie. Chapter One, A Story with Teeth The forces of retribution are always listening. They never sleep. Meg Greenfield Alice, two weeks before. Flaxed little monsters leered up at me from the pages, long and thin, short and stubby, wrinkled and hooded. My pen drawings captured the smooth curvature, wiry hairs, angry center veins, Alice's wondrous emporium of phallic impressions, an ode to my fascination and disgust. It was a culmination of my work over the past few months, what I did while my clients thought I was listening, taking notes on their trivial complaints. Each secret portrait was floppy and absurd. I held the latest out in front of me so I could expect it in the light. Better shading this time. The shaft is really showing some depth. The hair texture needs work, but all in all, good work. Alice! Brenda's cheery voice beamed through the crack in the door. The startle nearly made me throw my drawing at her. She poked her head in. You have a new client coming today. I slid open the lowest desk drawer beneath her view and flicked it inside to join my collection. Quite the history of trauma. Her brow furrowed, accentuating the hairline wrinkles around her almond eyes. Thanks for the heads up. She shifted back into her usual smile, exposing the thin gap between her teeth. Her carefully coiffed hair mocked my half-hearted updo. I know Mark's last-minute case assignments can be quite jarring. Would you like me to take this one on? I paused for a moment, watched her ruby-red dragonfly brooch glitter under the fluorescent lights. So, um, I giggled like a teenager reading this first paragraph. Mm -hmm. Uh, It was a very unconventional opening, and it was shocking to the point where I was like, "Uh, I'm sorry, what is going on here? Uh, And I can't think of a more surprising opening. We didn't really meet Alice. We just kind of saw what she was seeing. Um, Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we're reading these without context that we don't have a back cover to refer to, which can sometimes make it a bit tough to to know where the story is going. But I don't think we got enough information on who Alice is and what she does. It's kind Mm -hmm. of alluded to in the first pages. Uh, But I do think we could use a sentence where we're a bit more plainly told what she's doing and, and expected to do. You know, otherwise we get a little hung up on that very first hilarious paragraph. (laughs) Uh, But since we're having to chat about world building, as far as the world building goes, um, I envision her in like a library or a small office. And some of the cues are like really subtle, like the, like when she opens her lowest desk drawer to find or to hide the drawing. Um, But as you can see, in comparison to our last submission, we're kind of on the other side. The last one had a little too much world building and this one doesn't quite have enough. Mm -hmm. So something to consider and also just know that, you know, these are our opinions. Um, So the descriptions are super funny. And if anyone has seen Superbad, this kind of reminded me of like the whole montage at the end. I'm pretty sure it was Superbad. (laughs) I had a good laugh about that. And um, there's one part there near the end where I wasn't sure who was speaking. And I think that if that was clarified, that would really help with the flow of this first page too. Um, there's nothing like being confused about who's talking and you're on the first page. And if you have a reader that's already not super sold on it, that's usually mm-hmm. when they're going to like put it down and walk away. So you've got a really funny and unconventional opening. You just got to keep hooking us by the end of the first page. And then I think you'd be good to go. <laughs> yeah. So this is a lovely lesson in subjectivity. <laughs> Following up Maria's comments for this one was, was a little tough. <laughs> Uh, for me, <laughs> I'll be the first to admit, I mean, from the romance episode, people probably already know this about me, but yeah, I'm a bit prudish. I'm <laughs> not super comfortable with these topics. So um, while the opening was definitely shocking and unexpected, <laughs> those are words that you can use in this context. Um, it didn't give me the giggles like it did for Maria. It um, it <laughs> was easily <laughs> used. Okay, I'm easily <laughs> Well, th- most people say that the same thing about me, that I laugh at everything, but this one was like a I'm cringing. Do I really have to read this? Don't make me read this. Okay, I'm reading this. <laughs> um, and then I had to read it out loud. Uh, so that was fun. But I really want to stress that this is a highly subjective response. This means nothing in terms of the writing quality. Like, 
Once I calmed down and went back and looked at the opening line, um, I was able to actually think about it and, you know, think about it critically. But initially it was just like, this is not for me. So let's start there. Take that grain of salt very seriously. And if that's the only thing you take away from my comments, that is enough. That is perfectly fine. I think this is also a good lesson of knowing your reader and knowing them well. So whether you're self-publishing or whether you're trying to submit this to an agent, and I really want to stress this agent scenario, know your agent well. Know that they're going to respond well to this opening paragraph yeah. because some will not. And if you're not sure, do whatever the heck you can to find out because you could get blacklisted very quickly for a very long time if you've sent this to the wrong person. Just be aware of that depending on your publishing avenues. Market yourself well, please, <laughs> for me <laughs> and for other people like me. Yeah, so it's it's a hugely subjective thing. Again, it means nothing in terms of the quality of the writing. I think the quality of the writing is great. Yeah, it was wonderful, yeah. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it wasn't for me. That said, once I got past, I got over myself a little bit, okay? <laughs> yeah, I did. Um, we get so much character voice in this. Like, in, in the first couple of paragraphs, don't spit out your tea, please. I know <laughs> I, I saw that. Um, <laughs> in these first few paragraphs, we do learn a lot. Like, there's so much subtext to, to what we're learning about Alice. Even though we don't really meet her directly, I'm assuming she's a counselor of some kind. Whether that's clinical or not, mm. I'm not sure. That's, that's what I gathered from what I could tell. So I, I didn't mind the subtlety of that, especially if we get a little bit more information on back cover copy, like you were saying, like we're going into this a bit mm -hmm. blind. We don't really know what Alice does, but from context, I think she's a counselor. And yeah, lots of subtext there about how she thinks in the privacy of her own thoughts. And then the fact that she still tries to make her clients think she's paying attention also says a lot about her and the fact that Either she needs this job or she thinks she needs it or she wants to keep it for some reason. Mm -hmm. But that seems to be the only reason she's still trying because otherwise she doesn't really think of her clients very compassionately, um, which is very interesting for a counselor if that is indeed what she is. My first guess, she's quite disillusioned with her job. So I'm imagining that she'll have some kind of conflict to do with her employment in this story. If that's not the case... That should become a little bit clearer in the first chapter or so. Otherwise, it's going to be a distraction. And then if the primary conflict is going to be with this new mystery client, who is intriguing, um, I would recommend not drawing out their introduction. So we get Brenda's interruption kind of introducing this is the direction this scene is taking, and that's fine. But if, if the client that's coming in is the important piece, I'd keep Brenda brief. I'd kind of end it where you've already, where you've submitted and close off that conversation and introduce the client as quickly as possible to keep the reader reading right along and introduced to the plot right away. Because I think that's the only thing that I was missing was like, okay, where are we going with this? Because as unexpected and shocking as that first paragraph was, it did not give me an idea of the direction of the story. But yeah, I think this is a really strong opening for many re reasons. Uh, with a lot of character, it's intriguing. There's intriguing information. So I imagine it that this will be enough to hook a reader into wanting to know more, hooking the right reader mm -hmm. in. Like even me, I'm saying I was put off by the opening. I still want to know what's going on because it's shocking and unexpected and somewhat uncomfortable for me. <laughs> so um, <laughs> that's not a bad thing. Take all of that with a grain of salt. Remember who your reader is. And yeah, that's all I have to say about that. Has a friend or a family member ever opened a conversation with you by saying something like, guess who I saw today? And you don't guess because it's a stupid question and that's fine. So they tell you anyway because they know it's a stupid question even when they asked it. And if you're sufficiently shocked by the big reveal, the next words out of your mouth will usually be, what, where, why, how, details, woman, give me details. So... I don't know about you. Well, I probably know about Maria, but yeah. <laughs> the general you, the you who is listening to me talk incessantly. Um, books are like this for me. So when a story opens on a line of dialogue that throws me right into this conversation between two characters, right into the middle of it, I know nothing about them. I don't know anything about what's going on. Or we get introduced to a character by their description in relation to somebody else. I always feel a little bit lost, I'm floundering a bit, until the author gives me a physical anchoring point. Um, whether that's a climate, the earthy smell of a forest clearing, the crackle of a fire in the cozy confines of a cabin in the woods, um, 
setting the stage, setting the scene. I need to understand something about the world around the characters before I can fully begin to understand the characters themselves. Um, so in our last, in the two submissions that we critiqued in the last several minutes, um, where I mentioned this, but we had kind of two extremes. We had one submission with a lot of world building up front and the other one with very little, um, almost none at all. And before I spread misinformation, world building isn't necessarily about physical space. Like it's not just about the location that you're in. That is a part of it because it often will coincide with the era you're writing in or, mm. you know, a whole bunch of other de details. But it's about everything from climate to culture to ecosystem. It includes the terrain. It includes the creatures. It includes the magic, if there is some, and the people groups that live in it. And that is what makes it seem like such a huge, mm. monstrous, daunting task. <laughs> yeah. And I think a lot of writers forget that even if you're not writing fantasy, you still need world building. Yes. And the characters still live in their world. Their world looks different than your world. So when I think about an example of this, think about someone that you know, that you don't know super well, but they live in a completely different world from you. Like even if you work together or you just sport together, what they go home to is very different from what you go home to. So, for example, <laughs> you both love books. I think everybody listening to this loves books. <laughs> so, one of you likes dark wood bookshelves and witchy stories and candles and cozy blankets. Mm. And the other person likes, you know, white bookshelves and romances and fake flowers and, like, bright fairy lights. So, consider these things when you're building your character's life, like, whether it's in a fantasy world or in, a, or in the real world. Mm -hmm. I feel like I can like see myself in both of those categories of people. And Me I too. Don't I got, know a, what to I got do. a blend of both. I got a bit of both going on in my house. <laughs> and that's okay. And that's allowed. Um, the next thing to think is like start small. We've established that this mm. is like a huge monster of a task and it feels way too big if you start there. Um, you can start small. You may feel like you need to have your entire map drawn out down to the ecological and climate details of every little sector. Um, you do not. You don't need a color-coded legend and decades of history behind it before you start writing about your characters. Um, that's hogwash. That is bullshit. That is procrastination in some cases. You might be the writer who does need that. Like, let's be fair. Outliners mm -hmm. are outliners through and through, and they might need yeah. a lot more. Um, you might not need any of that, or you might need some blend. You might want to have some details before you get started. It's all kind of part of the process of figuring out what do you need as a writer to get started, because... Maria and I have said this before, we are not natural born outliners. We've only no. started trying to outline in the last couple of years and it's trying you know, and failing. Yeah, uh, yeah. It's not going <laughs> not going great, but it's not going terribly. Um, so we'll be we the first to say <laughs> we'll be the first to say that you know what, if you just want to start with nothing, start with nothing. Um, I find that if I get too deep into the act of writing backstory and figuring out the legends of, and myths that my cultures were created on, that is procrastination for me. That is my own version of a writer's block, and it's completely self-inflicted. Um, so <laughs> with world building, just like when I'm confronted with a to-do list that seems so long, it will never end. This is me every day at work. My strategy is to start small. <laughs> Start with the things that I do know. Start with the things that I can do and expand only if necessary from there. So if I'm opening a scene with a setting and a character, I probably haven't decided what the land around the scene looks like yet. Not entirely. I might have some loose ideas, but I probably don't have anything concrete. Um, but I should have an idea of where the character is in the present moment. What area are they standing in? Is it a house? Is it a cabin? Is it a tower is it a mansion is it are they outside like let's start real basic <laughs> and then step one I set the stage I think of it like a play if that helps you've got a limited amount of space on a stage you can't build out into the balcony and behind the eaves and behind all the curtains like you have the space that is set up before you behind those curtains that open up you're sitting in the audience and like that's it that's all you get to play with that is your sandbox um this way, I have a limited amount to fill, so I'm not going overboard imagining everything and getting bogged down by all the crazy details. So give us a feel for the space. Give us a feel for the temperature in this area, the surroundings, the humidity, the season, but it's for this area. We're not talking about the entire province of BC. We're talking about this small, tiny corner of Vancouver. Um, 
maybe you're off on a pier somewhere. Like that's, you know, that's as big as it needs to be. And then step two, you can introduce your character because now I have an idea in my head of where you are. Um, and a setting is useless without a character to drive it. So if you're just painting us a picture of where we are and then leaving us with that, uh, that's it. It's like, I, I can go to an art gallery and get that. That's, that's not what I'm there for. I'm there to read a book, so I need a story. Um, so step three is to make the two interact. You have a character, you have your scene. And this is where you can start adding in the other details. As the character is walking around or talking, have the environment around them weigh in on the moment. So locations, even if they don't move, they're not static. The walls and floorboards don't necessarily move unless you're watching Encanto. Great movie. Please go see it. I mean, uh, that. Magic. It's a super cute magic system. And it's, yeah, highly recommended and very <laughs> fun. But in the average household, the walls and floors should not be moving. Um, but the characters do. So their eyes are going to flicker over things endlessly while they talk. Chances are they're not just going to be like staring at the person because I don't know if you've ever met anyone who does that, but it's very uncomfortable. So awkward. Oh my God. Oh. Oh, the, those people scare me. I don't know if they're mm -hmm. actually entirely Serial human. Serial killers in the mm -hmm. making. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you look around. Like I know I'm really bad at making eye contact because I find it uncomfortable. So I need to get better at looking at people, but like I'm looking everywhere except at the person that I'm talking to. This is a thing. I know I do this thing. Um, but when you're when you're in a character's head, even if they're not, you know, nervous about eye contact, they're still going to be seeing the things around them in their periphery. And that's how you get more detail into a character's life entwined with the world without going completely overboard. Mm -hmm. I think my favorite thing about that is having the character interact with the world. Hmm. Like that's exactly how a book should start. Like that's super powerful. And if you're having trouble doing this, this is kind of an exercise I did while we were, while I was writing my notes for this episode. So do a little world building exercise for yourself. You're mm -hmm. sitting wherever you're listening to our podcast or wherever you write or whatever, and start picking up the things that you might notice as someone in that scenario, if you were writing, reading about them. So like, for example, like right now, like I'm sitting in my home office, I'm on a video call with Elise, I can see her um, you know, I can see I've got my book journal that I haven't written in for like way too long. <laughs> I have an empty cup of tea. I've got like a blackberry and honey candle burning. Mm -hmm. um, my plants need to be watered. You know, like one of my dogs is laying in here and they're staring at a sunspot on the wall. And then, there, you know, the like the world of my office has been built right there, mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. there. And, you know, later when you've finished your, your draft and you're ready to fine tune things, you can go back and reread that first chapter and decide a couple of things. Like, is the story starting in the right place? And it, how much of the setting can you cut while giving us enough to anchor us in the setting? That will help tighten up your first page. So you can write everything you need to write for the world to help you get into the story mm -hmm. and get it going. And then when you go back and edit, pull some stuff out. You don't need to have everything that's in there. You just don't need it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's there's going to be unnecessary pieces. And that's where you get into mm -hmm. the killing your darlings conversation. Because it might be like yes. a gorgeous sentence. And you think it's necessary, but it might not actually be. It might be more of a distraction, honestly, yes. than, yeah. than what you want. Um, but there's, there's no tried and true. There's no, this is exactly how to do it. There's no roadmap for this that we can easily hand no. out, as fun as that would be. Um, so it's hard to give kind of a concrete idea of what to include, what not to include. Um, yeah, unfortunately, this isn't a five steps to award-winning world building for uh, for dummies or anything. Wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> um, that would have helped me get started a lot quicker. But me too. Um, yeah, my my knee jerk instinct to the question of like what to include in world building as just a general opener um, is everything emphatically and in all caps, but that's not actually true, especially after what we've already just said. So you do need to include all elements of the world, yes, but only as far as they make sense and they add to the plot and they add to the characters and they add to the settings that you're trying to build. So random details that have no bearing on any of those other elements can be super fun, super fun, but also distracting and counterproductive, and they can take away from the story that you're trying to tell. So an awareness of how everything connects can be really important. You may not know what works and what doesn't until you have the full story, until you've written the end 
and you look back and think, okay, I introduced this element and I never used it for anything other than a fun little quirk, cut. Um, and it gets easier once you once you're in that space and once you've done it a little bit. But that's that's how I try to think about it. And then if you go into a paragraph about like the wonder of this is, for example, this is going to be a crazy example that may or may not make sense. Bear with me. You go into describing the wonder of this snake cheetah monkey creature that you've created in the history of your urban fantasy novel set in London, and you talk about the magnificence of this thing and its bloodthirstiness, and maybe it's got vampire elements, and it's just this, you know, the most wonderful, crazy, imagined creature that no one else has ever dreamed up, and you just can't wait to share it. But then the creature never actually shows up in the story. The characters never encounter it. They never have to fight it or interact with it in any way. That's a a distraction. Um, Chances are... It shouldn't be in the story at all, because now you've got me, a monster-loving, creature-obsessed fantasy nerd. All I'm thinking about now is this creature and the fact that I don't get to meet it. And I'm just going to be disappointed and permanently distracted from the rest of the story, because that's all I can think about anymore. Um, so that's that's kind of a big picture. That's a lot of, a lot of detail. Um, <laughs> But I wanted to try and bring this down to more practical elements because that was what I was struggling with when I encountered this question in our notes. Um, <laughs> Sorry <so> about that. <laughs> <laughs> hopefully this will be a little bit more helpful. Um, world building should be just as encompassing as the real life senses we employ in everyday life. That's like when we were saying world building is everything from terrain to, to culture. Um that's where it comes into kind of the nitty gritty is what makes or breaks it. You've got your sight, your smell, your sound, your taste, and your touch. And you want your world to be as realistic as the moment when you burn your tongue on a piece of pepperoni pizza and scrape the tip of it along your teeth to alleviate the sting. You feel that. It's about richness, not amount. It's about quality, not quantity. So you might have all of these details planned out, but you're picking and choosing the ones that make sense for the scene because okay, this adds a breath of fresh air here. This adds the smell of cinnamon here. This adds the feel of my hand against the bark of the tree. Like small things are often what make the most impact in the world building category. And then last but not least, I will always harp on subtlety. Maria's laughing because she knows that I've said this too many times in her lifetime and she's going to have to hear it again. Um, (laughs) Readers are smarter than we think they are. They are quicker than we think they are and they don't need to be spoon fed. And I have to remind myself this every time I sit down to write. They don't need an entire political system spelled out for them in three pages of nausea inducing textbook language. They don't need or want that. Um, So what I try to do when I'm having to introduce some more heavy stuff that I know could get boring pretty easily is um, my favorite rule of thumb. Every scene that I write should be doing more than one thing at the same time. Mm -hmm. So yes, I want to, I want to get into this political conversation because that's really important to the world that I'm building, but no one wants to just read about that and the history of Mm -hmm. that by itself. If that's what I wanted, I would study real world politics. Um, (laughs) So, I want to try and make it fit into a dialogue between a couple of characters um, or the the elements of the plot that are most intriguing and moving steadily forward. And I want to show some character development in that conversation. Like that is what is going to make those pieces more information, more, more interesting. Um, Mm -hmm. And the more you can tie it in with the rest of the story and the less information you have to give, the more it's going to fit and the more intriguing it's going to be, and the better it will hold your reader's attention. Yeah, I think it's in, it's important to always be pushing forward in your story. I think a lot of a lot of people will get hung up. I'm going to get to my info dumping rant later. <laughs> um, <laughs> describing things like I need them to understand everything so that the next part of the book makes sense. But uh, you've lost them on page two of the political crap. Mm-hmm. Like they're. They've checked out. They're gone. <laughs> They're gone. <laughs> They're skimming it and continuing reading, or they put it down and said, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> so that's something to to think about as well. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, when you're thinking world building, like I'm a big fan of like nature and animals and like the the world setting. Mm-hmm. So 
you know, this is where you get into kind of show me the world that we're in. Yeah. Don't tell me about it, right? It's like if your characters are in a crumbling Scottish castle at sunset, Ooh. tell me about it. Like, Ooh. I want to know. Throw that into their conversations. It doesn't have to be two paragraphs describing the castle and the sunset. Right. And then, you know, it can be the characters having a conversation and like they're standing outside the castle and like one of them notices like the crumbling Mm-hmm. Whatever, I don't know my castle parts off the top of my head. But you know what I mean, right? Or like the sunset, like it's shining in their eyes, but like it's so pretty. You know, there's so much mm-hmm. you can do to to put the world, like bring the world to life, you know? Um, yeah. And, you know, same thing with like like the weather. I mean, you can always, you can be like, yeah, it's miserable and rainy now. Okay, Um cool. That's like the text I send to my mom. (laughs) That doesn't hit. Right. But if you start, you know, throw that in with some information, like despite the wind and the rain or like the biting wind Mm. and the rain, like magical creature of my choice still does blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, (laughs) I've said this before and I'll say it again. I like to feel anchored in a scene. I need to feel like I'm there I need enough information descriptions to feel like I'm standing there watching this play out like it's a film so imagine your favorite fantasy movie or show or whatever and like I'm thinking kind of like the witcher right now right Mm -hmm. um so in the beginning when the settings like first revealed we meet our main character that's what your first page should feel like oh that's what you want to make your reader feel like Mm -hmm. and what did you notice in those moments in that opening scene yeah and so you can use this as an excuse to go watch your favorite show (laughs) <laughs> i know what i'm doing tonight yes. <laughs> chasing vibes chasing yeah, vibes, chasing vibes across yeah. the internet um, yeah so i think i think this leads us to, to the most common mistake i would say very very likely the most common hands down is assuming that world building always means straight up information which we've harped on and we'll harp on some more and we'll harp on it to eternity. I know Mariah has a fun (laughs) rant coming up and she's very excited for this conversation. Um, So I won't take away from that too much, but uh, yeah, world building is not about writing and textbook info, but it can easily become that. So Mm -hmm. bringing in that idea of subtlety and weaving pieces of information into a narrative throughout dialogue and other parts of the story, that's, um, that's going to be your saving grace. Because when your world building reads like a textbook, you've lost everybody pretty much in the first little bit. Some people will put up with a lot, but uh, too much information, people will skip it. And then yeah. they might miss something that, yeah, they needed to know, but because you buried it under all these piles of information, they never not they never got it. So then they get to the end of the story and they're like, well, it doesn't make sense because of this. And you're like, well, no, that was in that, that, that five-page uh interlude about the the political climate you didn't read you didn't read that no you didn't take notes yeah yeah, there you go it's so yeah subtlety and um and remembering that okay the reader can piece together things that i sprinkle in way more effectively than i think that they can yeah you want them to be like oh yeah and this they feel really smart Mm -hmm. when they put the pieces together figure it out themselves oh yeah because i love that i'm like this makes me feel smart i like this book more than i did a few months ago (laughs) (laughs) i'm so smart yeah just fan those flames of ego it'll get you exactly (laughs) so we're finally at my info dumping rant (laughs) <laughs> Which I actually pared it down because I, I didn't think oh. anyone would want to listen to me talk about it forever. This is, this is it pared down. At least he's laughing so hard right now. <laughs> ah, okay. So there's nothing that pulls me out of a story more than seeing like a full page or more just information. Like no wow. paragraph breaks. <laughs> so it reminds me of high school and probably university too, though I can't remember super clearly um where you had to read pages and pages of a textbook and then you had to summarize the only useful shit into one paragraph just Ew. summarize the useful shit into one paragraph like <laughs> save the people's brain do the work for the reader <laughs> do the work for them yes so there's a lot of like great fantasy stories that would have had like the best pacing and world building if it had just been like a little more subtle like i'm mm. thinking of one series in particular i've talked about on this podcast before <laughs> that remains nameless but so great and then i'd hit like four pages of info dumping and mm. i was like oh, well we were just at such an interesting time mm-hmm. 
And the mm-hmm. whole time I'm reading the info dump, I'm like, I want to be back yeah. like a couple pages ago where like shit was actually happening. Yeah. <laughs> so what I mean by that, here's a little example. Character A, why do the zombies have no brains? Character B, well, it all started back in the war of 1775 when Commander blah, blah, blah took away the zombies' <laughs> brains by using a magical power. Then in 1800, <laughs> you see what I mean? No one wants to read that. Like, do that in your first draft. Like, for sure. Like, info dump in your first draft. Because you're learning the world just as much as, like, the reader would be learning the world. But you're going to edit that shit out before they have to sit yes. through it. Okay? Yes. So get the information down so you have it. Sort it into a world-building doc. You don't need to use it all. There's lots <laughs> of world-building stuff that I have. Like, I did, like, some extensive research for my <laughs> Greek mythology story. Like, extensive. Like, I bought, like, basically a textbook and made notes. And I have those all in the doc. Did I use, like, I don't even think I used half of that stuff. Oh, man. But it was there, and it probably made the story better just because I knew it, right? Mm -hmm. So that's fine. But just consider that when you ask someone a question about a topic that they know about, Hmm. they don't generally give you a full lecture. (laughs) Unless, Unless you're asking me about horses. You might get a lecture. We, we all have that one topic, right? <laughs> yeah, everybody's got the one topic, and that's fine. But uh, yeah, keep that in mind when you're writing. And just also remember that like blocks and blocks of text will drag the pacing, like even if mm-hmm. it's necessary information. Like if your point of view character already knows the information you want to share, then build it into a scene. Yeah. When you send your draft out to your beta readers, ask them, are there parts of the story where you felt overwhelmed by information? This is a very important question to include for your beta readers. And then ask, are there any parts where you could have used more information? Mm -hmm. Would have been more clear if you had expanded upon it. That's good. And that's, that's kind of how you, you'll know what you need or what you need to add, what you need to take away. Yeah. And then (laughs) How to tell if you're info dumping. This is your personal <laughs> test. If it's starting to sound less like a story, more like a news report, or your fantasy novel sounds like nonfiction but with dragons, you got a problem. <laughs> so, like Elise said earlier, have your characters interact with the world is so much more powerful than just than just listing things of importance. Mike, drop. I feel like we could just end everything there because that's, you know, that's all we wanted to say. I've been waiting like almost two seasons to have my rant about info dumping and I'm quite <laughs> proud. I hope that it made sense to you. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. And you did condense it, to be fair. I feel like. Yeah, I did. The amount of when times we've talked about it. this, you've been writing this lecture ever since we met and you've got <laughs> yes. it down. You've got it nailed. <laughs> And I'm pretty sure in our writing group, I have already practiced this lecture for people. So I was ready. Oh, yeah. You are <laughs> this ready. This is like my fifth draft. Fifth. <laughs> <laughs> it's been through so many betas. Okay. Yes. So we've talked about what to do. We've talked about what not to do. And uh, we've kind of already gone through examples with our first pages at the beginning. So whether this next section is useful or not, is up to you. But it's always helpful for me. It's always helpful to look back at books that I've read and loved um, to compare that with what I know, what I think I know, what I know I don't know, and what I'm doing now. Um, So I couldn't help myself. (laughs) I I went with two of my favorite fantasy authors because they are my weakness. Um, And I tried to pick things that were different, that were different enough, even though they're still in the same genre. So the first one is middle grade. It's um, a good example of Lots of world building in a short amount of time. The second one is from one of the wordiest authors I read. So the passage is a little bit longer, but I think it packs just as much of a punch, um, just in a more descriptive, robust way. So let's get into it. Let's compare and contrast. That makes me feel like an English teacher. (laughs) Oh, I'm so sorry. Uh, So example one, from Howl's Moving Castle by Diane Wynne-Jones. This is one of my favorite feel-good I want to be happy books. So. Which I still haven't read, and it's on my shelf looking at me right now. <laughs> I'm waiting for a really gorgeous edition of it from the Folio Society, and I cannot wait. Mm. Ah, okay. Be nice. So this will be just a little teaser for me for when I get it in the mail. In the land of Ingery, where such things as seven-league boots and cloaks of invisibility really exist, it is quite a misfortune to be born the eldest of three. 
Everyone knows you are the one who will fail first, and worst, if the three of you set out to seek your fortunes. Sophie Hatter was the eldest of three sisters. She was not even the child of a poor woodcutter, which might have given her some chances of success. Her parents were well-to-do and kept a lady's hat shop in the prosperous town of Market Chipping. Ta-da! Love that. Oh, man. So, this is a bit of a traditional fairy tale-ish start, and that's why I chose it. There's a reason why the Once Upon a Time thing was so popular yeah. for so long, because it works. So, I would say Jones has done so, so much in two short paragraphs. Um, even while establishing character, she is world-building. So, we're given the name of the land, we're given the existence of some magical objects, so magic is a natural part of the life here, and then we're given a cultural standard for not only wealth and class, but family dynamics, societal mm -hmm. expectations. Um, and we're introduced to a character, and she does it all in plain and simple language, with a quirky touch of fatalism for Sophie, which makes it really fun to read. So, this is not a podcast about why you should read Diane Wynne-Jones, but please read Diane Wynne-Jones. <laughs> and for a little bit of contrast, The Way of Kings by Brandon Sanderson, is one of one of my favorite series that he has ever done. And it's massive, so prepare to commit. Kalak rounded a rocky stone ridge and stumbled to a stop before the body of a dying thunderclast. The enormous stone beast lay on its side, rib-like protrusions from its chest broken and cracked. The monstrosity was vaguely skeletal in shape, with unnaturally long limbs that sprouted from granite shoulders. The eyes were deep red spots on the arrowhead face, as if cre created by a fire burning deep within the stone. They faded. Even after all these centuries, seeing a thunderclass up close made Kallak shiver. The beast's hand was as long as a man was tall. He'd been killed by hands like those before, and it hadn't been pleasant. Of course, dying rarely was. God, I want to read this immediately. Uh -huh. I'm just going to sit here and let you absorb that. So. <laughs> what a I, hook. Oh yeah. My God. Mm -hmm. I could nerd out about Sanderson all day long. <laughs> I won't because he's already popular enough. Um, but he does, he does some incredible things. Four things that I noticed in this opening. First, he establishes the fantastical. He establishes this creature that we don't know of in real life, um, but we get a pretty decent description of it. Second, he establishes a timeline, so these creatures have been around for a long time. This character is very familiar with them. They have been known. They're not these mystery things that have suddenly appeared. So we know we're not getting into a story about, why are these creatures here and where did they come from? We know that. We can move on. He doesn't have to even tell us the details. Third, he establishes some kind of magic. So this character, Kalak, Kalak, don't don't harp on my pronunciation. It's not fair. Uh, this <laughs> not character, <laughs> exactly, <laughs> amateurs. Um, this character has died before. What does that mean? Like, what? What does that mean? I, I haven't read the first book in a while, so I'm already like hung up on that, and how amazing that is. And we don't know, but it means at the very least that the rules of this world are not rules we're familiar with. So. The, and the character isn't surprised by this. So the fourth thing that Sanderson establishes then is that magic is known and normal. Similar mm -hmm. to Jones and Howl's Women Castle, the characters of this world will likely be familiar with the concept of the supernatural, which that explodes your options of the direction mm -hmm. that you can go. But it also sets up your expectations for the reader of what they're getting into, which is huge. Mm hmm. And keeping with uh, Elise is more wordy and I am not, I think really <laughs> short examples. <laughs> really long Thank examples. you, Maria. Everyone can thank <laughs> Maria now. Uh, so, yeah. So I picked, uh, the first one I picked was from Fable by Adrian Young. If you haven't read that, it's great. It has a beautiful cover as yes. well. Yes. Oh. <clears throat> that bastard was leaving me again. Between the trees, I could see Koi and the other kicking up sand as they pushed off the beach. The skiff slid into the water and I ran faster, my bare feet finding their way over twisted tree roots and buried rock on the path. I came through the thicket just in time to see the smirk on Koi's lips as the sail dropped open. So that's a lot happening in a short paragraph. That's mm -hmm. the first paragraph of this book. So we know the main character has been left there before, wherever there is. We know she's on an island or a beach. We know she's trusted Koi against her better judgment. And we know that he's an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> Quite a lot oh, of information man. in, what, one, two, three sentences. Mm -hmm. It's pretty darn good. I think your examples um, are better than mine. <clears throat> <laughs> well, to be fair, I was like, 
I'm going to pick something that's short and easy. I picked, up, <laughs> I picked up a few books before I picked up that one. I went, oh, yeah, this isn't a good length for me. <laughs> I'm also not the uh, the reader of the, the two of us for you know, our little audiobook, audiobook practice. Um so my second pick, if you haven't read this book, I mean, what are you doing? Uh, An Ember in the Ashes by Saba Tahir. It is so good. Oh, mm-hmm. my God. Okay. Mm-hmm. So anyway, <laughs> I won't go on a rant about how great it is. My big brother reaches home in the dark hours before dawn when even ghosts take their rest. He smells of steel and coal and forge. He smells of the enemy. So super oh, short. I just got chased. Intro. Hmm. Yeah. And we get the vibes. This is what I'm talking about when we're chasing vibes. That's like the perfect example. Yes. So the author tapped right into sense of smell, which is very powerful. And I think it's overlooked a lot, honestly, in, in books as well. And we know, so we know she has a brother. We know he's not supposed to be out. That's kind of the vibe that we get. He smells like somewhere he shouldn't be. And he smells of the enemy, which tells us that there's an enemy in this book mm-hmm. right away. Mm-hmm. And that we know something is going on with her brother more than she even knows yet. All of that done in two sentences. Like two. amazing, amazing. Damn. She is so, ugh, those books. And yeah. I, I, I am proud to say I read it first and recommended it to you. You did. Yes. yes. And everyone kept recommending it to me. I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'm going to get to it. I'm going to get to it. And mm-hmm. I finally was like, stop being the baby and open it. Because like, I, I sometimes <laughs> like will put off a book I know I'm going to like because I'm like afraid of how much I'm going to like it. And, yeah. You know, you can only you can only read books for the first time once, you know. Mm-hmm. So like, so you know, sad. now that I've read it, I'm like, oh, I wish I could read this for the first time again. But... <sighs> Anyway, that being said, we do have a few um, books with excellent world building for you to think about or read or, you know, if you haven't read them yet, again, why? Um, <laughs> the first one being the Deva Bad trilogy by S.A. Chakraborty. Mm. I'm probably saying all these names wrong. No, she is amazing. Yeah. The first book is City of Brass, and that is probably the best world building that I can like recall reading in recent memory. Like it's just fantastic. It's so, yep. there's so much depth to it. It's just, yeah, you got to read it. Mm-hmm. It's amazing. Um, Number in the Ashes, which we just read a quote from. Also fantastic. I'm on book, I'm about to start book three. It's, it's coming up. So I, I can't say how it all ends. I but... finished the, the series and yeah, keep going. Keep reading. <laughs> Don't stop. And, Don't uh, stop. I won't, I promise. <laughs> and then there's An Enchantment of Ravens by Margaret Rogerson, which I have oh, not read, but Elise has read. She oh said my goodness. <gasps> I listened to the audiobook, which I don't normally do. Um, mm-hmm. I've just started getting into those for my commute to work. And this one is, it's Fae. So I think mm-hmm. Court of Thorns and Roses, uh, Holly yeah. Black, uh, any of those. Nice. And so I was, I went into it like with, yeah, lower expectations because it's like we're going into the Fae thing again. It's yeah, kind it's so of the same across the, the board. Moment. Everyone's doing it. But mm-hmm. good God. Like, yes, she she follows some of the rules that the other authors follow, but the way that she describes it and plays with it and introduces the characters and talks about the Fae in human interaction is just like mind blowingly amazing and gorgeous added and, to my endless oh list my of books God. to read yes and the cover is yes. beautiful so there's that too oh sold I, know I, love <laughs> covers. I judge a book by its cover and i'm not ashamed <laughs> to say that <laughs> not at <laughs> all which actually leads us right back to fable which has a beautiful cover by adrian young and i that was my first sample that i read mm-hmm. um it's a young adult fantasy and it's really well done and as someone who doesn't do boats I was still quite enthralled by all the descriptions. <laughs> As someone who gets very motion sick, I was like, I still love this. This is fantastic. Um, and The Switch by Beth O'Leary, which I adored. I think it's like the cutest contemporary romance, mm-hmm. like dual point of view, but not from the love interest's point of view. Like yeah. it's a grandmother and a granddaughter and like they're different Ugh. stories. And oh my gosh, it's just like the cutest, yes. cutest ever. Yes. Oh, yeah. I love that one for how it, yeah, how it... Because it's contemporary, it's in mm-hmm. the world that we live in, but she still manages to make this distinction between big city life and uh, small rural yeah. English town. And So cute. Oh, the vibes. The yes. vibes. Like that's <sighs> something to read when you just want to feel good. Mm-hmm. You just want to feel mm-hmm. good. Mm-hmm. 
you've messed up at work this week and you want to feel good. (laughs) Yeah, that was, I was listening to that the last couple of weeks. That was my audio book on the way to work. So it was like, okay, I got to work feeling good. And it was good. (laughs) Oh, so good. The last one we have is Skyward. This is another Brandon Sanderson plug. Mm -hmm. Um, slowly becoming a super fan and don't tell anyone <clears throat> that's a level of nerd i do not aspire to but skyward is a young Dolph sci-fi that i read last year and once i picked up the first book i couldn't stop reading that series until it was done so yep that's the only sci-fi one we have in this list but mm-hmm. it just it brings the power of sanderson's world building into the power of futuristic technology with a kick-ass female protagonist who is like just not conventional and not what you expect and i want to be her but i also (laughs) recognize that she had a lot of character growth to do and he does it super well and just everything about the series everything but the world building Mm -hmm. across the series is just phenomenal and the twists and turns and he just yeah he knows what it's he's also doing. also sitting on my shelf. Thanks to your encouragement. <laughs> sense, I was like, all right, I'll buy that one. I mean, you don't really have here. to encourage me to buy books. <laughs> you should be like, hey, I think you should read this. I'm like, you know oh, what? Don't say Add to cart. Add to cart. <laughs> and that's the tea, or in this case, the wine on world building. Please rate and review us wherever you get your podcasts. You can follow us at the Tea Grannies Podcast on Instagram and at the Tea Grannies on Twitter. We'll see you again in two weeks. Happy writing. <laughs>